Well, I hope we've all had a, a peaceful night's rest. We've uh, gained an hour. We ought to be really refreshed with that extra hour of sleep. I think a lot of times we still pack things in, even though we might have an extra hour of sleep. We really don't. But I hope you're refreshed as we begin a, a Lord's Day. And we last week we got we're coming to the end of Lesson Six and entering to Lesson Seven. But we're in Deuteronomy, the, the 23rd chapter, going into the 24th chapter. And this latter part of this lesson six, we see what was to be how the, the slaves were to be treated, especially if they came from another a country, that they were to be able to pick the place in which they were to, to live. And we talked about that last, uh, last Sunday morning. So that's, we, we talked about the oppressed servants. They didn't have a place to go. If they came from another country, they had no place to live. They could pick their places. And that was being kind to, to them. I think it relates to the fact that God relates it to the people of Israel. They were once in bondage to Egypt. And so they were to be kind to people that are going through the same thing. But in this particular lesson, we begin now with question number 28. Did it matter how people earned their money, but only that they would give it to the treasury? Why would we, why would we make that statement? Because in verse 17, there shall be no prostitute of the daughters of Israel Neither there shall be a sodomite of the sons of Israel. We saw those are male homosexuals, I mean male prostitutes, and those are, are, are female prostitutes. Well, we know that's wrong, but what about their money? What about their money? Well, if they give it to the Lord, it's okay. Look closer. Verse 18. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot, are the wages of a dog, which was your male prostitute, into the house of Jehovah, thy God, for any vow. For even both these are an abomination unto Jehovah thy God. Not only their sinful practice, but what wages they took as hire to bring that into the house of God and pour it into the treasury, that was wrong as well. So God didn't want your money. And if you just don't donate to God, you just live like you want to. Under the old law, that was not going to happen as well. So let's notice in question 29. You can lend your money to your fellow Israelite, but he says, and you could receive interest if it were not a high interest rate under the law of Moses. The idea is just don't make the interest rate so high, then it will be okay. Is that true or false? Well, I think you're, you're right, that was, was false. They were not to lend their money to their fellow Israelites uh, for interest. Notice in verses 19 and 20, to notice this distinction between the Israelite and the foreigner. Thou shalt not lend upon interest to thy brother interest of money, interest of vittles, interest of anything that is lent upon interest. There wasn't anything. Well, we could lend it, but just don't make it too high. That's usury. You know, that, that's really bad. No, they were not to do that at all. Unto a foreigner thou mayest lend them upon interest, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon interest. Didn't say if it's too high, you know, if it's low, it's okay. You're not to do it at all. That Jehovah thy God may bless thee in all that thou puttest thy hand to in the land where thou goest and to possess it. Can you imagine if they were doing that on the side? and they were wondering why their business is not prospering. God punished people in that day, and his people, Israel, which were indeed physically connected with him and as he has given them spiritual food, but how to conduct their lives in, the, in their world as well. They were not to lend their money to interest to a Jew. They were only to do that for the farm. It was allowed that way, all right? Question number 30. How important is keeping your promise unto God? We talk about vows. And in the Old Testament, we were to swear by Jehovah that it wasn't that you're not supposed to swear at all, but it was to understand that when we brought God's name into something, it was very serious. And when we promised something before God, it was very serious. So when thou shalt vow a vow unto Jehovah thy God, Thou shalt not slack to pay it, for Jehovah thy God will surely require it of thee. And here is why it's serious. It, is, it would be a sin in thee. 
It would be a sin in thee. Do we have to make a vow of any promise we make? No. Because the next verse says, But if thou shalt forbear the vow, it shall be no sin to thee. That which is gone out of thy lips shalt thou observe and do, according as thou hast vowed unto Jehovah thy God, a free will offering. It was all up to you if you're going to vow that or not. It was a free will offering. But when you vow that, promise unto God, it was to be taken seriously. And you promised it with your mouth. You need to back it up with your deeds. Because if we don't, it is a sin. Do we look at our promises? Just say, I promise to do this, I promise to do that. And if we just don't say, well, I, I, I vow to, before God to do that, can we separate that? Jesus says, let your word be yea, nay. Live up to your word. And people want to dissect the law of, of God and say, well, I, 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 you know, I didn't promise that, and make an oath to God. We need to keep our promises. It's that important and necessary. From our marriage promises to, to keep one another, as long as we both shall live, keep ourselves pure, to promise in sickness and in health to keep people and keep our mates, try to keep them healthy and strong, but be there for them. Those are vows that God sees and God requires that of our mouth. But it, you don't have to make those promises with a vow. That was the point as well. Verse 31, I just have in quotation marks. My vineyard is your vineyard. Is that something that took place and under, under limited circumstances in the promised land? Or was my vineyard, your vineyard, where we live in a socialistic society, that's the way God has it, and therefore you don't own any property, your vineyard is my vineyard? Now let's listen to what he says in verse 24. When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat of grapes thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put in any put it in any vessel. When thou comest into thy neighbor's standing grain, thou, thou mayest pluck the ears with thy hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle into thy neighbor's standing grain. Do we get the, the difference there? You can satisfy your hunger at that moment of time. We, we see a lot of times when our, we go to, out to eat and big portions are given and, whoa, we can't eat all of it. What do we ask for? Doggy bag. We, we ask for some. We could take our, 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 what we have left over away from us. We put it in a vessel. We weren't to go a man's grain like that. We'll pick a lot of it. I mean, now, and I'll just save a lot of it and I'll put it in a, in a doggy bag and save it for later. You couldn't do that. Nor could you bring a sickle as if you're going to harvest some of that grain. That land belonged to him. That harvest belonged to him. But what the law said is people were going through the standing grain. There was a sense of sharing and that it was lawful for them. Just I'm hungry to take that. That's what the disciples were doing in the New Testament time with Jesus. And they were, and it's happened on the Sabbath day. And they were accused of violating the Sabbath. No taking a sickle. To that grain would have been but plucking the grain was indeed lawful and there was a difference between harvesting and satisfying the immediate hunger of someone and that closes our 23rd chapter now we enter into lesson seven and this is going through chapters 24 through 26 and our time that we have left i want us to see what uh, what we have here especially in these first four verses and I will read those verses, then we have some questions connected with it. When a man taketh a wife and marrieth her, then it shall be if she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some unseemly thing in her, that he shall write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, who took her to be his wife, her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Jehovah, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which Jehovah thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Here was something that would be a sin on the nation. It is indeed an abomination just like 
Homosexual sex is an abomination unto God. It is that serious. But here we find where there is legislation allowing for divorce. Allowing for divorce. And so we have some questions we want to see and put it, put it in its context and hopefully we'll have a better understanding. For what reason, question number one, for what reason or reasons could a husband divorce his wife? What do we see in this? Well, he, she finds no favor in his eyes. Why? Because he found some unseemly thing in her. Let's concentrate on the word unseemly. That Hebrew word is translated a lot of times in the Old Testament as nakedness. Now we've been studying already in Deuteronomy the idea of nakedness where it was dealing with the, the sexual connotation of that, uh, the, the sexual uh, intercourse and that sort of thing is with, as the idea of something that would be nakedness, uncovering the nakedness of someone. And is that what he's talking about here? And I'm saying no. There's something different here than just a, a, a sexual relationship that was unlawful because that was going to be punished under the old law with death. She wouldn't be living. You're not going to put her away in a sense of, of that. She's, she's not going to be living because even there would be the test to see because you have reason for being jealous of her. You could give her that test and the water, drinking the water, and her body would be deteriorated off this pot and she would die. If she, were, if she were guilty. But here is the point of what could it be less than that? It might be some indecency that she is exposing in public. The word sometimes denotes the barrenness of the land. And it very well may be that blaming her for not having children. After all, that's what the marriage relationship was instituted for. And not just companionships, but that bringing forth children in the world and having that family relationship. So there could be other things short of adultery or fornication that was there. We know in, Hebrew, in Jesus' time, they were arguing, the rabbis were arguing that burnt toast would be enough to put one away. Others said, no, it was going to have to be just the sexual uh, immorality that would be involved. So the, the rabbis and people had discussed this passage a lot. But Jesus refers to this. But here was something unseemly, short of fornication, but something that was, she did not find favor in his eyes, maybe not producing children, thanks to y'all too, or idea of being dressed indecently, maybe exposing nakedness uh, in public or before others. But God allowed this in Moses' day uh, to put her away. Now, that would be a lot of reasons, but I've given you two there. Uh, that's just not the sexual relationship or sex, illicit sexual relationship. Question two, what must a husband do when he divorces his wife? When he's going to send her away, he was to give her a bill of divorcement. Here was to be put into her hand, and the reason being is that she can now be another man's wife. Well, that bill of divorcement. Now, the authorities in Jesus' day said, well, if you're going to allow for divorce just for fornication, how come Moses allowed it for all these other, other reasons? And he said, because of your hardness of heart, that he allowed that. That's not God's design for marriage. It's to be one man, one woman for life. But what he recognized, that here were people putting away their mate indiscriminately, whatever they didn't like of the person, giving her a bill of divorcement, and send her away. Why was that bill of divorcement given? To protect her. Women did not have a lot of rights, especially being protected when they were all alone. And this allowed them to go and be a, another man's wife. And that bill of divorcement, that would be something separate. Well, my will is to divorce you, but there was a bill. There was a paper with that. Uh, that was connected with the divorce, that this is now allowing her to be another man's wife. And what we need to understand is this, this is contingency. This is not saying this is okay with God, because we know it's because of their hardness of heart that he instituted in the first place. But it was contingency legislation. If this happens, this is what's going to occur. If, if, if. And there's going to be ways of, of, of governing that. And so 
you write her a bill of divorcement, give her a hand, send her out of her house, and when she's departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. All right? That's done. Question three. What could the former husband not do after the divorce? Notice there that she could not ever be his wife again. He could never have her back. What was that? How was that protecting the woman? Here's a man who just gets mad one day and he has this right. He feels like he can just put her away. It's unseemly in my eyes and find something against her. And he could just do that when he wants to. And then a day later, he, he, he kind of feels sorry for what he did. He'd like to have her back. You better make sure of your decision. Don't let it be haphazard. It's to be something that you better be sure of because you can never have her back again because that was indeed an abomination to God. And therefore, again, protecting the woman they were so quick to divorce. He's trying to slow it down. It was legislation to slow that down, have some protection for the wife. It's question number four, is God in this law justifying the divorce? Is that what's, what, what's happened? Is he, is he justifying that? Not, not at all. And question number four, he's not justifying it at all. We know when Jesus sets four things in Matthew 19, we see what God wanted from the very beginning. And there'll be only one reason for divorce, and that is, that is fornication. All right? Question number five. What, what is God saying about marriage in the law regarding the new husband? Now, we're looking at another context now. Not this new husband she, ran, she got to marry again. But here's is when a man taketh a new wife and... This, was, this could be indeed another situation. What, what, when a man took, taketh a new wife, he shall not go out in the host, meaning in the army, neither shall he be charged with any business, and he shall be free at home for a, how long? How long would that, would that be? A whole year. And he says, and he shall cheer his wife whom he hath taken. So that relationship was to be Together, you know, he's not going to serve in the army, not going to be involved in, in, the, in business deals and so forth. He was there to concentrate on, on cheering his wife. And that was part of the law as well. And it's just kind of interesting to see how he wanted them to, to be together and see him in that relationship that we noticed there. All right, as we're looking at these various laws, let's, let's continue with question six. What was part of a meal not to be taken in place. I didn't say a meal, M-E-A-L, but we've got to put ourselves back. And there was an upper millstone, and that's kind of what we're dealing with here. And it was grinding, it's very heavy. It would be grinding out the, the grain in order to make the meal, in order to make the bread, in order to do what? Feed our bodies. Why couldn't you take that as a pledge? because that was necessary for them feeding their bodies. It wasn't something, well, we'll just keep out and, and see if I pay the debt or not. You were taking something that affected his, his life. And so no man shall take the meal or the upper millstone to pledge. Like I have a debt, I'll give you this as, as a pledge. You can take it if I don't fulfill it. You know, you're not supposed to do it for he taketh a man's life to pledge. And you know we're supposed to do that. These were things necessary to life. All right, question number, uh, verse seven. We notice if a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, what do we, what will we call that? What will we call stealing someone's, uh, shall we, we call it kidnapping. So that's why we put it in that question. If a man found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, and he deal with him as a slave or sell him, then that thief shall, what? Shall die. And so shalt thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. It'll be punishable by death. It is equivalent, you know, to be by selling him, and especially selling to, as, as a thief. And then that thief shall die. He stole something that didn't belong to him. And that's the punishment for kidnapping. Do we have those in our books today? We used to. A lot of laws have changed that that's not. You might get a long sentence, 
But kidnapping is punishable by death under the law of Moses. Question number eight, why were the people, what were the people to remember Miriam? Why were they to remember her when told to follow the directions of the priest regarding leprosy? This takes us to Numbers, the 12th chapter, and I'll ask you to turn there with me. Because when I think of this passage, the first thing I come to is that God is defending Moses before Miriam and Aaron for being the one that God talks to face to face, not as he would with a prophet. And they were murmuring that he was taking too much on him. And Moses did not try to defend himself before them. That's why verse 3, he was very meek above all the men that are upon the face of the earth. But God does his talking for, for him and says, this is what he is to me. And if we see in verses 9 that indeed God brought leprosy upon Miriam. So here we see in our text here about laws regarding uh, leprosy. And let's just keep our finger there and we'll come back to it in just a moment. Let's see what the text says in, Deuter in Deuteronomy when he speaks about this. Take heed to the plague of leprosy, verse 8, that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priests and Levites shall teach you. As I commanded them, so shall ye observe to do. Remember what Jehovah thy God did unto Miriam by the way and ye, that she came forth out of Egypt. My first thought, well, well, I know what he did. He struck her with leprosy. Well, what did that have to do with the law? Well, you look a little bit further in this text. He did strike her with leprosy. But when Moses in verse 13 cries unto Jehovah, Heal her, O God, I beseech thee. Jehovah said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in his face, or her face, she should not be ashamed seven days. Let her be shut up without the camp seven days, and after that shall be brought up again. What's God saying? Is he going to be separated from the people for a certain amount of time? That was his law concerning Miriam. Don't forget her when you think about, do I have to obey these laws? Don't forget what God did to her. It wasn't, I punished her with leprosy and I'll punish you again if you, get, if, if you don't like it. No, it was not that he had a law set there. He's got a law for your leprosy too when that happens. So he's trying to cause them to remember that indeed when Moses wanted her to be healed, she was healed, but it was according to law. And God says, if a father, a father spit in her face, she'd be unclean for seven days. So they were to be unclean until they were healed of that, of that leprosy. Why must a lender not go into a house of a borrower when determining a pledge? That's our next, next question. And let's just get the picture. You've gone to someone who owes you money and they haven't paid yet. And you're going there to get a pledge. What will they let me have that's a value to them and until they pay that? What were you supposed to do? Well, you weren't supposed to go in their house and pick what you want, <laughs> in essence. When thou dost lend thy neighbor any manner of loan, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch your pledge. Then shalt thou stand without, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring forth the pledge without unto thee. And if he be a poor man, thou shalt not sleep with this pledge. Thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down. He needs his garment. We've seen that in other passages in the Bible. That he may, that he may sleep in his garment and bless thee. And it shall be righteousness unto thee before Jehovah thy God. It was to take care of the situation of a poor man. But here you were to enter the house. He was to bring that out freely himself. So you weren't to go in and say, I'll take this. You weren't supposed to do that. And that was part of the law of Moses as well. A poor man's garment could not be taken for a pledge. Is that true or false? He says, Thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his garment and bless thee. So when the sun goes down, he's going to need the warmth of a garment. And therefore they were not to, they, were to, they could take that, but they could not keep it past the, the sundown of that day. The same way of uh, employing others as well. What action is considered oppressing a hired servant and therefore uh, a sin? Not paying. Verse 14, Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or the sojourners or in thy land within thy gates. Okay, 
if he's a foreigner or not, you're going to pay. In his day, thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he's poor, setteth his heart upon, uh, upon it, lest they, they cry unto thee unto Jehovah, and it be a sin unto thee. So that would indeed be a sin if they did that. Pay the day's, day's work. And that's how, that's how people were paid. They were paid by the day's work that they, they offered, offered you. If the children are not able to be put to death for the sin of the father, that's what we see in this text, the father shall not be put to death for the children, verse 16. My question is, why were the sons of Achan put to death when he sinned? And Joshua 7, verse 24. He did the sin. How come they were put to death? And one distinction we can make, maybe these children were of age. <laughs> Maybe they were part of that, of that uh, plan in order to, so they were responsible for their own sins. But it also could be if they were young children and along with his wife, indeed, they, they suffered the consequences of a man's sins. They weren't guilty of that sin, but sometimes we suffer the consequences of that sin. A man is an alcoholic, that's his sin, but it sure does adversely affect others. On this occasion, they all were, were put to death in Joshua 7. But there was a difference between guilt and facing the consequences of uh, an evil father. All right, question number 14. What should justice look like in Israel? What should justice look like? In verses, we'll, we'll look at this, the, the last few verses. When thou reapest thy harvest in thy field, as for God, a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go in to fetch it. It shall be for the forgers. So they were to allow their fields, they were to leave something for the, the foreigner, for the poor, for those who were uh, going, going by. When thou gatherest thy grapes of the vineyard, thou shalt not glean it after thee. It shall be for the sojourner, for the fatherless and the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. One of the things he says about widows that we won't see it in Exodus, verse 17, thou shalt not rest the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless, nor take the widow's raiment to pledge. You could take a poor man's, but you have to give it back to him, his garment. Give it back to him before the sun went down. But you were never to take the widow's raiment. And therefore, you rest justice due to the sojourner or the fatherless, those who don't have anyone to protect them. So when you were not treating the sojourner correctly or the fatherless, that was not justice that was to be doing done. And it's not justice to take away the widow's garment at all. So there again, your land is how God instituted laws to help the poor to help the widow, to help the sojourner, and says, I want you to always remember in that last verse, you were bondmen once. Remember where you came from. It'll help us in how we, we treat others. Glad you could be for this class this morning and next Lord's Day, the Lord willing, we'll, we'll begin with uh, chapter 25 and, and, let, and question number 18. Thank you.